Greetings again. Thank you very much for coming back for this uh, session. In previous session, we talked about variables, voltages and currents and power, and the relationship between these variables. We also talked about the component laws and the way components behave in respect to voltage and current individually. Then we also talked about topology. When we had the topology in mind, we had nodes identified, we had loops identified. For nodes, we wrote Kirchhoff current law. For loops, we wrote Kirchhoff voltage law. Before I begin the next phase, I want to just touch a bit of a base on a few simple topics we left behind, and then I'm going to go in and I'm going to talk about parallel series structures. Now that we know what parallel series, uh, what, uh, parallel series mean and what the uh, topology laws are, let's begin having two voltage sources in series. This is V1, this is V2, and I'm actually looking from this angle. This is, I'm going to call this Vx. Well, if you write a KVL law for this, although this is Vx, we can always assume that there is a loop here. We talk about what the current of that loop would be when we get to the mesh analysis. But if this is a loop, and I begin my journey from this point, and I'm going to have this loop completed, what do you think I should do? Now, that's the direction clockwise. I'm going to see minus Vx because the minus polarity of Vx is met first. Then I'm going to have plus V1. Then I'm going to have plus V2 as equal to zero. Let's put this in perspective. Vx take it to the other end. So V1 plus V2 is equal to Vx. This a kind of a rule of thumb for us if you wanted to see how to simplify. If you have a voltage source of 9 volts and you have a voltage source of 5 volts, you can see that these two would be either added or subtracted depending on the polarity they have. If this was plus minus plus minus, you can actually feel it like this. Um, here is a height, so from the ground to the desk, is one height from the ground to the end. So I'm going to call this height 9 volt. And then I'm going to have another height on top. I'm going to call it 3 volts. So basically uh, what happens is that I have 9 volts and then I have 3 volts. Or I have 9 units of uh, basically 9 units of uh, height plus 3 units of height. I'm going to have them together, I'm going to have 12 units of height. You can see that they are added, but at the same time you can imagine this. If I have 9 units of height and then this goes under the desk, then the end of this book versus the ground would be 9 minus 3, which would be 6 units of height. So if they are supporting each other, it's one voltage and then it's another one, it's actually kind of coming together and summing up, and that would be my voltage. But if they are opposing each other, this is plus minus and minus plus, when I write my KVL law, I can see it's going to be V1 minus V2. But you don't have to memorize this. All the time what you have to do is to actually write that simple KVL in your mind. That tells me Vx is equal to V1 plus V2. I have to do a warning. Can I have two voltage sources in parallel? This is a voltage source, this is a voltage source. This is called 9 volts, for example, and this is called 3 volts. Is this a possibility? Well, structure-wise, I have a loop. So let's do this. Here, I'm going to begin from here. I'm going to go through the loop. That's my direction. I'm going to see minus 9 and then plus 3 as equal to zero. Is that possible? Minus nine plus three as equal to zero? That's not possible. You cannot have two voltage sources in parallel unless they are exactly identical. So in order for these two to be the same, to be in parallel, this has to be 
9 volts. That's the only way you can have. So what is the conclusion of this simple uh, topic? Voltage sources can be in series, but not in parallel. And depending on what the polarities are, they are going to be summed up in series or subtracted in series. So that's what the voltage sources are. Let's go and see what current sources in parallel and series would be. I want to have two current source, and I'm going to have this as, say, 3 amp. Uh, for now, I'm going to call it I1. So I'm going to call this I1, and then I'm going to call this I2. As soon as I have this structure in front of me, I see two components. I see a node on top, a node at the bottom, and these two components see each other head to head, toe to toe. So you can, you can see that these two components will be in parallel. And also you can see this is the node. Imagine this is going to be uh, IT. And I'm going to write KCL law for this node. I need to write KCL law for this node. What I'm going to say? I'm going to say IT is leaving the node. I1 is entering the node. I2 is entering the node is equal to zero. I'm going to say IT, if I just solve that system, is going to be I1 plus I2. This is very easy to follow and understand. You have five people coming into this node. You have three people coming into the same node. Obviously, eight people are going to leave the node. That's very simple to see. If I wanted to replace this, I can always replace this with one current source. And I'm going to call that IT, which is the summation of I1 and I2. I can replace two parallel current sources with one current source, but it has to be, they have to be in parallel. They have to meet head to head and toe to toe in that sense. I can replace it. But if I'm not, if I don't have these two in parallel, and still this KCL law stands. At this node, five people come in, nine people come in, 14 people leaving. But can I have two current source in series? Let's take a look. If I have this current source, and this current source is going to be 9 amp, and if I have this current source, which is going to have 3 amp, obviously that's not possible. When I say source, I mean there is an expensive, expensive force behind it. Take a look at this node. This current source wants to force 3 amp into this node minus 3, entering the node. This current source is taking out 9 amp out of the node, plus 9. Can this be 0? Obviously, this cannot be 0. Therefore, these two are, cannot be in series. The only way two current sources can be in series is if they are the same. When they are the same, you can replace it with one of them. You don't have to worry about two sources now. So this is going to be 9 amp. We need to see parallel series structures and we need to apply the topology law immediately to see how we can simplify. As human beings, we always like simplicity. So we need to actually replace them and basically simplify and don't, we don't want to have too many equations, too many unknowns when we get there. Another thing that I would like to talk before I go into parallel series combination is the value. When I have a current source, and this current source value has zero in, zero amp, what does it mean? If you want to, if you want to imagine what happens, imagine the tunnel we talked about. This is my tunnel. And there is, for any reason, an obstacle, a huge obstacle inside. Perhaps there is a complete blockage inside the tunnel. 
and nothing can go through the tunnel. The current, excuse me, is zero. The current is zero means no one goes from left to right. I can actually think of this as if this is a useless tunnel. This is a broken tunnel. It's the same, it's behaving the same as if you have a tunnel that is broken. This is one side of the building, this is another side of the building, and if you break, it, break out this tunnel, no current can go. You can jump from one side of the street to another. That's going to be I as equal to zero. Because of that, when I is equal to zero, I can always replace that with an open line. I as equal to zero is a lot easier understood at the time of analysis if we replace it with an open line. Now, another scenario I would like to bring to your attention is a voltage source. If the voltage source is zero, what does it mean? This time, we are not talking about the broken line. The line is there, but people have no energy inside to go from left to right. If you don't have the energy to go from left to right, obviously someone else can go. You are actually offering the tunnel to anybody else who wants to go if they have the energy to go. And as such, I can actually replace this with a short line. This is, as you can see, I can always say, hey guys, ladies, gentlemen, this tunnel is available to you. Anybody who wants to go, please come and take it. So in that sense, it's going to be a short line. Now I'm ready to begin and put together all the pieces we have talked about inside simple structures and build libraries. We don't do anything without the use. We want to actually grab the knowledge, extract the knowledge, and basically apply this accordingly. What I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about parallel series of resistors and voltage source and current source. Talk about voltage divider and current divider. And then I'm going to go into the book and basically solve a number of questions for you. So let's begin. Uh, basically, uh, um, libraries, I'm going to call that library. And I'm going to do with series first. And then I'm going to go for parallel. For series structures, I have a resistor. This is R1. I have another resistor that is R2. They are in series. I can identify it because this is a node. And I can see only two components meeting in that node. Then I'm going to have a voltage source that is coming in. This I'm going to call for now a DC value, a constant value, and I'm going to say E, flat response. No variations, no alternating values. The question is, we know R1, that's 10 ohm. We know R2, that's 5 ohm. And we, knew, we know E, and that's say 12 volts. Solve the system. That's the key. When I say solve the system, I need you to tell me all the currents and all the voltages of this design. Now, if I take a look at this E, I already know what the voltage is. I said it's 12 volts. I already know that. So the only thing that is left that I don't know is going to be the current. I just went in and I just assigned IT this direction. When I get to the R1, I'm going to have one current assigned that I don't know, and I'm going to have one voltage polarity assigned. When I get to this one, I'm going to again, I'm going to assign a current. But remember one thing I forgot to mention though. For resistors, if you assign the current, voltage is not yours to decide. If you assign the voltage, current is not yours to decide. So when I say voltage, when I say current is going to go this way, my voltage polarity has to be exactly like this. When I say the current is going to go from left to right, it has to be plus, it has to be minus. But for voltage source, I can do anything. I can choose anything I like. For some reason, because I knew the knowledge behind the scene, I selected the directions I wanted so that my conclusion makes more sense. But other than that, this IT actually can go this way. No harm. 
It can go this way. I t can be anything. But if I say I1 is a sign, I2 is a sign, B1 and B2 would be a sign. This is V2. How many unknowns do I have? I have two unknown for this, I have two unknown for this, and I have one unknown for that. I have five unknown. I need to have five equations, five unknown, to solve this system. Let's begin. What I need to do is this. I need component law, component law. Then I need topology law. And for topology law, I require KCL first or next and KVL. KCL attacks the node, KVL attacks the loop, and component law is just individual component itself. How many, comp how many components that are uh, easy to write the laws for? In this case, you have only two resistors. Since you follow the direction properly, ohm law, you can write it even close eyes. You can say V1 is equal to R1, I1. V2 is equal to R2, I2. That's component law. <coughs> when I get to topology law, I need KCL and I need KVL. For KCL, I need to identify nodes. This is one meeting place between the power supply and R1. This is the second meeting place between these two. This I'm going to call N1, this I'm going to call N2. And of course, there is one node that is at the bottom, and I'm going to call this N3, but remember, I simply said, why don't we call it difference? One of the nodes you don't have to, you shouldn't be writing the KCL law for. The system is going to be singular, meaning you can't solve this. So I have three nodes, I picked up one difference one. The rule of thumb says that if you have a voltage source, pick up the negative pin of the voltage source as your reference node. If you have multiple voltage sources, just pick up one voltage source and a negative pin and a reference. That's just to make it simple. If you have any possibility to arrange it to make it better, that's one thing we investigate later. But other than that, this is a voltage source. A single voltage source, a negative pin, I'm going to assign reference, I have two nodes, I'm going to write KCL law. Okay, for node N1, IT is entering the node, and I1 is leaving the node. For node N2, I1 is leaving the node, and uh, I'm entering the node, and I2 is leaving the node. Anything entering is negative, anything leaving is positive. <coughs> and done. You had two nodes to write the equations for, and you did. Then we need to go and write the KVL law. The KVL law requires identification of loops. So this one, I have only one loop. I'm going to assign clockwise direction to this loop. I'm going to begin from this end. And I'm going to go through this and see what happens. Okay. This is E for loop number one. Let's call it D. I'm, e, I'm meeting the minus polarity first, minus E. Then, when I get to R1, I'm going to meet the plus polarity next. Then R2, I'm going to see plus polarity next, and I'm done. You have three components in loop number one, or this loop only, and you need to have three terms to write this equation for. How many unknowns did you have in the first place? You had V1, V2, I2, V1, I1, and IT. You have five unknowns. You have one, two, three, four, five equations. You have enough equations now to solve the system. So far, this was done by a mathematician. And we are going to go and continue the job of a mathematician. Then we are going to come in and make a number of simple conclusions for an engineer, from the engineering point of view. Okay, let's begin solving the system. 
minus it plus i1 is equal to 0, it means it goes to the other end, positive, it is equal to i1. Minus i1 plus i2 is equal to 0, it's i1 is equal to i2. That's the solution of these two equations. Let's have a very close observation of this. it is equal to i1, i1 is equal to i2. What does it say? It says it is equal to i1 plus i2. I'm sorry, i1 and i2. My mistake. So it is equal to i1, i1 is equal to i2. So it's actually everything is equal. Now let's go back and understand this simple conclusion inside the structure. It says it is going, i1 is going, i2 is going, and comes back it, i1, i2. You have one loop. Obviously, they have to be the same. Obviously, five people, five people, five people, and you close. The currents in that loop, in this loop, is going to be the same. Obviously, if I have expanded design, that's a different story. We talk about that later. This is a structure. It has a single loop. It doesn't interact with any other loops. It's just this. These currents are all going through this. All, everything is in series in one sense, if you let, take a look. Everything creates a sense of series connection for everybody. The currents in series are exactly the same. So if you, if you have any two components in series, you can say the people who go in, go into the meeting place, continue the trip, and go on. That's the way we say. So when you have two components in series, do you have to define IT, I1, I2, and make the, the, the situation so difficult? No. From an engineering point of view, all you have to say is that I have only one IT to go for this scenario. Okay? So I'm going to say I1 is IT, I'm going to say I2 and IT is IT, and I'm going to utilize this. So let's go and utilize this knowledge. This one is going to be V1 is equal to R1 IT. This one is going to be V2 is equal to R2 IT. I utilize this in this system. What is known, what is unknown? You have R1, R2, and E. You have these components. What is unknown? The unknown would be I1, V1, V2, I2, and IT. I need you to put this into this equation. So let's put this. Let's put this into this equation and see what happens. It's going to be minus E plus R1 IT plus R2 IT as equal to zero. Once again, again, these are little things, the details. You get used to it, but then you have to pass on the knowledge and basically move on to the next level of complexity. This one, you have E. You have R1, you have R2, you don't have IT. Let's find it. So E goes to the other end. R1 IT plus R2 IT as equal to E. Let's factorize IT. R1 plus R2 IT as equal to E. You said IT, you don't know. Let's find it. IT is equal to E divided by R1 plus R2. When you say you found IT, what did you find? Remember IT is equal to I1, I1 is equal to I2. You found three unknowns here. Three unknowns are gone. What are the left unknowns you need to find? You need to find V1 and you need to find V2. Let's find them. Let's find them. That's the job of a mathematician. So V1 is equal to R1 IT. R1 IT. Let's do that. Now, V2 is equal to R2 IT. Okay. Now, 
you solve the system. Remember, this is equal to I1 and this is equal to I2. You solve the system. But the engineer is not satisfied with this dry solution of the design. Engineer says, let's make sense out of this, let's find some rule of thumbs and see what happens. Okay, I'm going to erase this part because I need the space. I don't no longer need these equations because I have utilized them very uh, much. So in that sense, I'm going to erase this. Let's understand this better. I want to rearrange this equation. The system has been solved. Now I'm playing with this. I want to say V1 is equal to E times R1 divided by R1 plus R2. Then from this equation, I'm going to say V2 is equal to E times R2 divided by R1 plus R2. I know E, I know R's, I know V1 and V2. I just gave you the equation for voltage divider. I have E coming in. In front of E, I have resistivity of R1 and I have resistivity of R2. Obviously, if R2 is bigger, I require more energy to go through this than I would to go through R1. That's very obvious. So if you have 1 ohm and 10 ohm, you need the people to go in. 5 people go, 5 people come back. The number of people are not going to be any different. But I want you to imagine the type of energy they need to spend. These 5 people come in, they see 1 ohm, they spend a bit of an energy. But then they see 10 ohm in front of themselves and they need to spend more energy to go, which means more voltage. So when I take a look at V2, V2 has a special relationship. The more R2 is, so I would say 1 and 10. I need 11 ohm in my mind. 1 ohm takes little energy to go. 10 ohm takes a lot of energy to go. So that's the way to go. This is 10. This is the total uh, resistivity I can see in front of my E. 10 divided by 11, that's the amount, that's the ratio of the energy I need to go for R2. In terms of the amount of energy I need, the guy or the gentleman or the lady need to actually go through this. They need to see 11 ohm in front. But they see 1 ohm. They move fast in one sense. So basically, they don't need really too much energy. So in that sense, this is going to be 1 divided by 1 plus 10. 1 divided by 11 times E. You need proportional energy to spend, to go. That's what the principle of voltage divider is. That's one thing we learn on this simple subject. Now, in order for this voltage divider to be true, and I see many people actually make a mistake here, is this. It has to be in series. You can't have another component here. If you do, then it has to be modified. We tell you how to modify this. You have to have only this loop in front of you. You have to have this and this in series in order to do a voltage divider. If you have anybody else at node 2 to come in, voltage divider has to be modified. So I need you to be careful on that. So that's the first thing we learn, voltage divider principle, and the voltage is going to be divided proportionally to the value of resistivity. The second thing engineer says is this. I know you have two resistors in front of you, but I want to have even simpler life. I want to be able to actually replace, I, I care about what happens at these two nodes. Whatever happens inside, I don't care. This, I'm going to model the two resistors in series, 
This I'm going to replace it with an equivalent design. Since the design in front is a resistive, is a resistive design, I'm going to replace this with an equivalent design. Generally speaking, the way scientists work is that they try to model a system, to model something. If you have a concrete in front of you, you need to see the physical geometry, you need to see the density of the materials used inside. If you have a metal in front of you, if you have a wire in front of you, if you have a stock market in front of you, you need to model that. So a stock market behaves according to perhaps customer sentiment, perhaps investor sentiment, perhaps depending on the different components, the news that they see in the newspaper. We try to model this, because if we model this, we can then teach a computer to do the task for us. If you look at me, for example, at the class, I'm going to be a teacher. In the lab, I'm going to be a helper. Uh, at home, I'm going to be a husband and a father. Um, often at home, for example, I do vacuuming, and I do basically taking the garbage out. So I'm a person with different functionalities. And when someone, a psychiatrist, for example, wants to study me, they actually talk about me as an abstract. They need to model me and then simplify me. That's the way they study me inside their course and text. I want you to put this and this into this. I don't care what happens inside. Of course, when I squeeze this, I'm going to lose V1 and V2. I can't find V1 and V2 inside this anymore. I lost that information. But I don't care. All I care is these two nodes from the source point of view. Now, from the poor source point of view, I have E, I have E. So far, so good. I have IT, I demand IT. Let me change this. I demand the same IT. If E and E are the same, IT and IT are the same, these systems are going to behave externally the same. Equivalent design. Now, let's do that. I'm going to call this V equivalent. I'm going to call this, since I selected the voltage, the current is not mine anymore. The current comes from the Ohm law. This is I equivalent. Now I have one node on top, I have one node at the bottom. Uh, this I'm going to call the reference node. This I'm going to call NX. Let's write the NX KCL law minus IT plus I equivalent is equal to zero. So obviously IT goes to the other end becomes positive, I equivalent, and this is understandable. This result is understandable, which means if these two components are actually connected to the single node, obviously the current that goes through here has to go through this. That we understand. Okay? Now if I write the loop and I assign clockwise direction to this, what do I get? The KVL law. It says minus E plus V equivalent as equal to zero. Minus E because I see minus first, plus V equivalent because I see plus first. And as such, E goes to the other end, becomes positive, E is equal to V equivalent. I wrote the two topology laws for this simple design. Then I'm going to write the component law. V equivalent is equal to R equivalent times I equivalent. I don't care about the equivalent, I equivalent. I, all, all I see is IT and E. I equivalent is IT. Let's replace this. This is IT. V equivalent is E. Let's replace this. E is equal to R equivalent IT. This equation I want you to keep in mind, and another equation we had when we solved this a few minutes ago, we said E is equal to R1, please refer to your note, R1 plus R2 IT. 
That was coming from this. We solved that before. And this is coming from the equivalent design. And it's very easy for us, since we expect a similar response from these two systems, it's very easy to, uh, for us to see IT and IT, if they are non-zero, they can cancel each other out. And it's, these two have to be exactly the same. We came to a very simple yet important conclusion. Two resistors in series can be replaced by one resistor, and that resistor is the summation of the two resistors. Let's call this simple relationship our rule, because I depend on the R value at this time, R1 plus R2 as equal to R equivalent. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go and basically give you a number of examples in a moment. But I want you to feel a few things. As soon as you see a structure series in front of you, and you have to verify that this is in series, these two are in series, you can have a voltage divider, and you can replace this with one resistor, and you can say all the currents are the same. These are the little things, knowledges, pieces of knowledge that you need to actually utilize in order to speed up your analysis process. I want to take you to another side, and that would be parallel structure, and then I'll open up the floor for examples to solve. Okay? In parallel structure, I'm looking at a current source. Let's call this value I. I is known to us. That's 10 amp, for example. Then I'm going to have a resistor, R1. Then I'm going to have another resistor, R2. I know R1, I know R2, and I know I. Question? Solve the system. What does it mean? Find me all the variables and unknowns in the design. Where are they? This is a current source. The current of this component is known. I don't know the voltage. I'm going to call this Vt. This is a resistor and this is a resistor. I just like it to say this is V1. And I like this one to be V2. The polarity is mine. I just selected this knowing that it's going to help me, because I have read the textbook already. But you can definitely have any polarity of voltages sign. But R1 and R2 are resistors. As soon as you select the polarity of voltages, the direction of the current is not yours to do. So the direction is already assigned. Has to go from plus to the component and leave the other node. Is I1 has to go through plus the component and leave the other node, I2. How many unknown do I have? One, two, three, four, five. I need five equations, five unknown, to solve this. Let's begin. The mentality is this. I need component laws. That's always I do for chapter two. Then I need topology laws. And in topology laws, I write KCL law and I write KVL law. For KCL law, I focus on the node. For KVL law, I focus on the loop. Let's begin. So basically, first thing I need is this. Where are my nodes? These three components are actually meeting in this one. This is a rubber band. You can actually squeeze this. That's N1. At the bottom of the components, you can see everybody is meeting in this node. This is N2. But remember, do you have any other nodes? No. You have two nodes. You have to pick up one of them as your reference node. In the absence of a voltage source, another rule of thumb, and that's just out of experience, is just to pick up the bottom line 
as your reference node. So I'm going to remove this, and I'm going to replace this with the reference node. As soon as I identify this as a reference node, I don't need to write KCL law for the reference node. I'm going to write KCL law for node 1. So node 1, KCL law. What do I have? Capital I is entering. A small i1 is leaving. A small i2 is leaving. That's my KCL law, and that's the only law and only node I have to write the equation for. In order for me to write the KVL law, I need to identify loops. I need to identify primitive loops, and then I don't have to worry at this time in this chapter for any other loops. Now, if I take a look at this design, I can see two primitive loops very handy. This one and this one. So let's do that. This one. I'm going to call this D1, this one, I'm going to call this D2. For this, I'm going to begin from this node. For this, I'm going to begin from this node. Let's begin D1 for KVL law. For D1, you will start from this node. The head of the arrow is coming in, hits the negative polarity first. So I'm going to see minus VT. The head of the arrow continues its trip. It sees R1 and the polarity on top is plus, so it's going to see plus V1 as equal to zero. Then I'm going to go, there are two components in that loop, and I just wrote two terms. Let's do D2. Once again, my journey begins from this dot. The head of the arrow is coming in, hits the minus negative polarity first, so it's going to be minus V1. Then it's going to continue, hits the plus polarity on V2, and then it's V2 as equal to zero. That's my KVL law. I wrote topology laws. Topology laws, some laws would be KCL laws and KVL law. I finished the topology law. The component law, because I followed the Ohm law and I followed the direction properly, I can actually write the component law even closed eyes. So V1 is equal to R1, I1. V2 is equal to R2, I2. Of course, the indexes are meant to be matched. So that's what we did. How many equations do I have? One, two, three, four, five. Five equations, five unknown. I'm done. I just need to solve this. From principal point of view, I have everything I need to solve the system. So let's begin solving the system. The approach is the same as what we did for the series connection. Vt goes to the other end becomes positive, Vt is equal to V1. V1 goes to the other end becomes positive, V1 is equal to V2. And this gives me a very similar feeling. It says Vt is equal to V1 is equal to V2. What does it mean? Engineer says, if you have components in parallel, and you can verify that they are in parallel, the voltages are all the same. This voltage is the same as this voltage is the same as this voltage. That's what this equation says. Voltages of components in parallel would be the same. Well, I'm not done with the solution. I'm going to utilize V1, V2, and I place them with Vt. That's my unknown. So let's do that. This one is going to be Vt as equal to R1, I1. This one is going to be Vt as equal to R2, I2. I need I1 and I2. I need to grab I1 from this equation, I2 from this equation, and put it in that equation. So with the case cell in mind, so it's going to be minus I, VTR1 plus VTR2 as equal to zero. Let's take a look at this for a moment. What do I have, what I don't have? I have I. I know that. That's 10 amp. I have R1 and R2. One of them is 1 ohm, one other one is 10 ohm. What I don't have is VT. So VT is one of the unknown. Let's see. 
Let's put my to another end. As equal to I. Let's factorize Vt. Vt times 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 as equal to I. And obviously, you can extract Vt because Vt is unknown. So basically, Vt is going to be I divided by 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. As soon as you say I found Vt and that's your victory, Vt is equal to V1 is equal to V2. You found three unknowns by one shot. This, this, and this are known. You have five unknown. Three of them are known now. You need to find I1 and I2. I've got Vt as equal to V1. I just need to put it in and I find I1 and I2. I need a space, so I'm going to basically take part of this down. But I appreciate every now and then if you go back to the note when we need to make some comparison in terms of equivalent design. Vt is equal to V1 is equal to R1, I1. So I divided by 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 as equal to R1, I1. Don't be frightened by the picture you see in front. Because as an engineer, our responsibility is to arrange it, is to make it look good and simple so that we can remember. <coughs> so don't worry about that uh, process. So I'm going to have, let's do the second thing. V2 is equal to R2, I2. So V2 is already Vt, so it's I divided by 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 as equal to R2, I2. My intention was to find Vt, V1, V2. I did. My intention is to find I1, I2. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to erase this part in order to achieve that. I1 you need. You need to divide this by R1. Since this is a fraction, I can actually divide the top by R1. So I'm going to say... 1 i divided by r1 divided by 1 r1 1 r2 as equal to i1 i can even write it better i can write it as 1 over r1 divided by 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2 times capital i let's do it for the next one this one i'm going to take this to the denominator of i i r 2, 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 is equal to I2. Since I want to make a sense and I want to have components that are very similar to be in the fraction, I'm going to take the I in front, so it's going to be 1 over R2 divided by 1 over R2, 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 times I. I'm now ready to declare the simplicity of the equations I just found. I1, where is it? I1 is this one. I1 is this one and it talks about R1. 1 over R1 divided by the inverse of these two. Where is I2? I2 is this one. So I'm going to attack 1 over R2, 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 times I. So if I have a few others, I can actually write it accordingly. I'm going to label this as the G rule. Why do I say G rule? One of the things I've, I should have mentioned earlier is that a resistor is defined by R, noted by R, and the inverse of R is noted as G. If the uh, R goes to infinity, which is open line, G becomes zero. If R is zero, which is a short line, G becomes infinity. But that's a different stuff. This one 
is going to be equal to G1 divided by G1 plus G2 times I. This one is going to be G2 divided by G1 plus G2 times I. It simply says, it's very similar to the series combination. It says if you want to have this current, G1 divided by the summation of G times I. If you want this current, G2 divided by the summation of the Gs times I. If you want another parallel component current, the same, G divided by, and you continue. This is, we call in this class, G rule. For parallel structures, you use the G rule. For series structures, you use R rule. In, in this class. Now, if R is ohm, sometime OHM, G becomes M, it's just reverse this, MHO, MO. And this is ohm, just inverse this, kind of omega. Sometime they actually note this in homework as S, Siemens. Siemens? This is a very old company, and it's a German company, I believe, and they have contributed a lot to electric circuit, and S comes uh, from the company's name. Actually, the company's name is the name of a long-time scientist, so um, basically everybody comes from that scientist's name. S, Mo, or the, uh, or the, uh, uh, or the om o Omega, in one sense. Ohm invest. What did we learn so far? We learned that components in parallel have the same voltage. We learned that the current is inversely proportional. And you can actually find I1 and I2, and this is called current divider. You are dividing the current. That's current divider. Okay? Now I want to alert you to a number of possibilities before I go and talk about equivalent design. If it was you, let me actually simplify this. Um, I don't care about this. I, I, I just want you to see um, the following scenario. This was a short line, and it was you who are coming to node N1. That's you. You go through the tunnel. You reach the node meeting place N1. You take a look at in front of you. Well, that's a very simple example. The simple example you can think of is this. You come, you land in Toronto. You come into the passport area. You see a lineup in number one, about 100 people are standing in that line. And you suddenly see similar gate with nobody there. And you are a passenger, you just came to Toronto. Which line would you go to? Obviously, the 100 people in that line, if you go and stand behind it, it's going to take a long time to clear the passport office. But obviously, if you have another identical booth that takes care of you, obviously, a rational mind says, 100 people is too much. Let's go into this line where the passport officer can take care of me. Here is you. You come in. You see resistivity in front of you, and you see no resistivity whatsoever in the front of you to reach the same destination. Same destination. Zero resistivity. What would you do? Obviously, you go, everything goes this way. So if I wanted to have this current calculated, how much this current is? Remember, R is zero, and G is going to be infinity. So if I wanted to apply this rule to get I2, G2 is infinity, G1 is limited, G2 is infinity, 
And since G2 and G2 are the same nature, infinity divided by infinity, that's 1, 1 times I, I2 becomes I. That makes sense. This formula is making sense. It says that when the current comes in, reaches the node, and it sees a short line in front, obviously everybody goes this way. Nobody goes this way. This current is zero. Since this current is zero, this voltage is zero. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. You remember we talked about the zero voltage. When you have a zero voltage, you have a short line. This is a zero voltage. This is a zero voltage. Everything makes sense. Zero voltage, zero voltage. Zero current, all the current goes through the least resistive path. Another way of looking at it is that if this is, let, let's try this one more time. In order for us to understand what this ratio means. This is 10 ohm and this is 2 ohm. It's not zero this time. If I wanted to know what is happening and what's the share of this current, people come into the passport line, they say 10 ohm resistance in one line, and they see 2 ohm resistance in another to reach the same destination, which would be past the passport office. Obviously, there will be more people who come in to this. The share that goes through this would be more. Is that true? Let's see. So let's uh, target this scenario. The scenario is I have a 10 ohm, I have a 2 ohm, and I have I coming in, and I want to see how the formula, the G rule, are going to play. Now, I have I1 for this resistor, I2 for this resistor. According to my current divider principle, it's going to be 1 over 2 divided by 1 over 10 plus 1 over 2 times capital I. Now, let's take a uh, common denominator on this one. This one says 10 is going to be 1 plus 5 times I. Then it's going to be 10 comes on top. It's going to give you 5, 6 I. When I want to calculate I1, I1 becomes 1 over 10. That's the G rule. 1 over 10 plus 1 over 2 times I. And if I simplify this taking the common denominator, that's 10. This is going to be 1 plus 5. But on top, I have 1 over 10i. And if I simplify 10 and 10, I'm going to get 1, 6i. There are a few things I note when I get to this conclusion. First, i1 plus i2 is capital I. 1 over 6 plus 5 over 6 times i is going to be 6 over 6. It's going to be 1i. And that makes sense. That's the KCL law. This one is going to be 1 over 6i. This one is going to be 5 over 6i. You sum them up, you get the same i as it enters the node. So that makes sense. That is a comforting to know because that's going to verify my result. But one thing I wanted to say is this. 10 ohm is a lot less than... Uh, 2 ohm is a lot less than 10 ohm. The current comes in. They see least resistive path to get to the same destination. Least resistive path would be 2 ohm to get to the same de uh, destination. If that understanding is correct, this current ought to be bigger than this. And I've got the confirmation. This current is five times more than this. This resistivity is five times less. The current is five times more. That's the way currents come in and they divide each other when they face a parallel structure. So far, what did, what did we learn? The voltages are going to be the same and the current divider principle applies when we use the G rule and we are done. Now, let's go and do the last thing uh, to complete the theory section for today and that is equivalent design. I want to be able to replace this design with the following design. The external component is going to be the same. The external voltage, if you remember, we had Vt. I want Vt to be the same. 
I want these two components to be the same. But I want to be able to replace this with a resistor. And I'm going to call this R equivalent. This is R equivalent for this structure. Every structure, every position is going to have its own R equivalent. Now, if you apply the principle rather fast, V equivalent here, as such, Ohm law dictates this is going to be I equivalent. If you write KCL law for this node, you can see I enters the node, I equivalent is leaving the node. That's the KCL law for this node. When I write KVL law for this loop, I'm going to see minus VT, minus polarity first, and then V equivalent next, and that's it. This is KVL law, that's going to be KCL law, and the component law demands V equivalent is equal to R equivalent times I equivalent. Let's put them all in perspective and see what happens. So this one, V equivalent is the same as VT, I'm going to replace that. R equivalent, I want to find it, I don't know. I equivalent is the same as I. I know what I is. I want this to be the same as this. So, let's see. Let me rewrite this so that a comp comparison is rather easy to carry out. It's going to be I divided by 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. In the case that the values and variables are non-zero, this one and this one cancel each other out. If I divide, this one and this one cancel each other out. So what did I do? I have two systems in front of me. This is going to be R1. This is going to be R2. I solved this system previously and I came to this conclusion. And I made a number of other important conclusions. Then I'm going to replace this with an equivalent design. And I went through that same principle and I got this far. Then I'm going to divide both segments, left and right. I'm going to assume that these variables are non-zero. If I do that division, this is going to happen as follows. It's going to be 1 on the left-hand side. It's going to be R equivalent on this side. And then I'm going to have 1 divided by, remember I is gone, R1 plus 1 over R2. Okay? Now, I ask you to please remember how to simplify this. Uh, the denominator, this one is going to come on top. I want this to be underneath. So this one is going to give me the following conclusion. This comes underneath 1 over R equivalent is equal to everything here will come on top. 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Unlike in series, when I have to say R equivalent is equal to R1 plus R2, in parallel, I'm going to say G equivalent is equal to G1 plus G2. It's simple, but it's in the inverse mode. It's a reverse mode. So 1 over R equivalent is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. This is what happens in the midterm and the final. People remember that they need to inverse this and this, but they forget that they need to do one more inverse to get R equivalent. You inverse this, you inverse this, you sum them up, whatever the conclusion is, you have to inverse this once again to get R equivalent in the design. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go through the homeworks and I'm going to pick up a number of examples, questions, and I'm going to apply the KVL, KCL the component law. I'm going to apply this technique. This comes naturally um, a kind of a uh, compression technique. We have two resistors in parallel, we replace it with one resistor. We have two resistors in series, we replace it with one resistor in series. We are compressing this, collapsing the design. We get in a simple form, after we are done, we decollapse it, we decompress it, we come back to the original format. Let me explain this not using a number of uh, cases, examples.
Okay. Suppose I have the following. This is a practice problem, and I strongly suggest for a successful midterm and the final not to ignore any example or a practice problem inside the chapter itself. Although you may decide not to read the text of the, the, uh, of the uh, reference textbook or any textbook, but I would urge you to please try any circuit you can, you, you can have your hands on and try to solve this system. Suppose you have the following design. This is practice problem 2.12, 2.12, and that's page uh, 49. 12 ohm, 6 ohm, 10 ohm, 40 ohm. And you have a voltage source of 15 volts. Let's see if I have everything. The question is asking us to find V1 and to find V2. Because we have learned the principle of parallel series structures, I need your help to identify where my chances are to replace segments of the design with a smaller equivalent design and therefore shrinking the design into a simple voltage source and a resistor. After I got some known values, I'm going to actually de-shrink the entire process, decompress it and go back to my original design. Because these steps should not be forgotten, you need to actually have them all uh, fanned out across the paper. You can't just have it in your mind. You need to do this one thing at a time. So I'm going to have a smaller design and I'm going to go here, here if I can, uh, so that you see the entire picture in front of you. I have a voltage source. I have four resistors in front of me. These two are in parallel. I can replace this with one resistor. The reason I say they are in parallel is that because they meet in one end and they meet in another end. These two are in parallel. These two are in parallel too. They meet in one end and they meet in another end. Therefore, I can shrink this into one resistor and shrink this into another one. Let's take a look. It's going to be 15 volts. I need you to be careful as to what we do. Obviously, through the practice, things are going to be a lot easier to handle later. First, we might go slowly. I'm going to call this R equivalent 1. I'm going to call this R equivalent 2. R equivalent 1 is supposed to replace 6 ohm and 12 ohm. R equivalent 2 is supposed to replace 40 ohm and 10 ohm. The first thing I know is 1 over R equivalent 1 is equal to 1 over 6 plus 1 over 12. Let's simplify. That's going to be 12 divided by 6. That's going to be 2 plus 1 is going to be 3. This is going to be 1 over 4. And therefore, R equivalent 1. Remember, you have to inverse the final conclusion. That's going to be 4 ohm. Let's try this one more time for 10 ohm and 40 ohm. 1 over R equivalent 2 is equal to 1 over 10, 1 over 40. Let's do this simplification. It's going to be 40 divided by 10, 4. 4 plus 1, that's going to give me 5. 5 divided by 40, that's going to give me 1 over 8. And therefore, R equivalent 2 is going to be 8 ohm. What did I find? I need you to play a chess with me. This one is 4 ohm. This one is 8 ohm. I'll tell you what I mean by playing a chess in a moment. What am 
I trying to find? I'm trying to find this voltage. Because these two are in parallel, this voltage, if you remember from the principles we discovered just a few minutes ago, this voltage is the same as this voltage. It's the same as this voltage. I want this voltage. If I want this voltage, they are in parallel, they are the same, V2 and V2, and the outcome is going to be the same as V2 here. What do I see in front of me now? I can see a 4 ohm and an 8 ohm in series in front of 15. That's a series structure. And if I wanted to do that V2, for example, I'm going to use a voltage divider principle. I'm going to use the R rule. So it says R equivalent 2 divided by R equivalent 1 plus R equivalent 2 times the incoming voltage. That's going to be V2. Let's do it. R equivalent 2 is 8 divided by 4 plus 8 times 15. This is going to be 8 divided by 12. So it's going to be uh, 4 divided by 3 times 15. So this one is going to be 5, 4, 20. Again, let's see if we made a mistake because now I know there is a mistake. I'll tell you why I think there is a mistake. Because this voltage and this voltage in simple structure like this cannot be more than 15. If you are supplying 15, you can get plus minus whatever you can get. But it has to be less than 15. That's why this number is wrong. So R equivalent is 8, 4 plus 8 is 12, 12 I have 8 divided by 12 times 15, 2 thirds. it's going to be 2 thirds, you're right, 2 thirds times 15, thank you, so this is going to be 2 times 5, that's going to be 10, this makes sense, this is wrong, and I simply made a mistake in simplification process. So 8 divided by 12, 2 thirds, 15. This is less than 15. Naturally, I would say 15 comes in, 10 drops on this, 5 has to drop on this. Because 5 plus 10 is going to be 15. Naturally, that's my KVL law. But let's see if that's true when I take a look at the second length. So it's V1 is equal to R equivalent 1 divided by R equivalent 1 plus R equivalent 2. This is the, t the R rule we call times 15. This is going to be this time 4 ohm divided by 4 plus 8 times 15. So this is going to be 4, 12, 1 third, 1 third and 15. That's going to be 5. This is 5 volts. That makes sense. When I say you need to play a chess, this is the way. You need to actually see your moves ahead of time. You want to say, if I shrink this, what do I lose, what do I gain? If I shrink this, what do I lose, what do I gain? Obviously, by shrinking, you get a resistor. What do you still have or maintain? That's V1, because everything is parallel. But how about this current? Do you know how much this current is? Of course not. Let's call this I3. Because as soon as you put the, these two together and you create this resistor, you lost your sight on I3. I3 is just inside this component. You can't access this anymore. You have access to V1 and your access is the same as it was before by this, doing this. But I3 is not the same now. I3 is not the same as the I that goes through R equivalent. You have to be careful on that. When I shrink this, what do I lose? What do I gain? I'm going to gain simplicity. Fine. I'm going to maintain V2. Fine. But if I wanted this current, can I see it inside? No, I lost it. So you can say, okay, I'm going to go in. I'm going to find a V. But your chest needs to go a number of future moves. You need to come back and say, okay, if I find V1, how do I find I3? Didn't you say V1 is the same as V1 is the same as this one? 
You said these voltages are all the same. That's what they, they are in parallel. If I know this voltage, Ohm law says I3 is equal to this voltage divided by 6. Ohm law says 5 volts divided by 6 is my current. This 5 volts divided by this 6 is my current. I want to find I4. The trick I wanted to play is this. Let's shrink this. Let's make it simple. Let's find it. But when you find V2, this V2 is the same as this V2 is the same as the V2 you just found. I4, according to the Ohm law, is equal to V2 divided by 10. And V2 is 10 divided by 10. That's going to be 1 amp. So what did I do? I made a plan. The plan is, let's shrink this. Let's utilize the principle of parallel and then series and then whatever we get in terms of Ohm law. But then you have to come back. You have to come back to the original design if you have an unknown that is already lost through the process. You need to come back in order to retrieve it. So it's compression and decompression. You compress the design and you decompress it. You shrink it and you de-shrink it. That's another pro process that we would be uh, doing in this process. Let me uh, make another example. I'm going to go and pick up one from uh, chapter 2 in this case. Intentionally, I want to pick up 2.38. relatively big, but there is a reason for me to do that. 16. 12. This is problem 238 from page 71. Eighty. Six. Fifteen. Five. And a voltage source of forty volts. Questions? Questions are I want to find this I, and I also want to find R equivalent that is seen from this angle. This red one is not working, so I'm going to see if this red one is helping from this angle. So what is the plan? I need to play a chess now. After talking all about the deep understanding of component law, topology law, everything, after we have come to utilize a kind of a library in our mind, we need to begin properly using the, those pieces of knowledge. You have a second in front of you. This second seems to be frightening at times. There are so many components. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you plan to write KCLKB law for this one, you are going to spend a, a more than an hour just to write the equations. One, two, three, four, five primitive loops. So many other loops that come in your mind. You have no, 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 no. Confusing. But if you utilize, that's what the engineer says. The engineer says if you utilize the understanding, you should be able to finish the solution, the finish, to go to the finishing line a lot faster. What do I have, what I don't have, and what my process is going to be? 
I have a bunch of components in front of me. Easily, I can see 12 and 6 are in parallel. These two, one end come in and meet, the other end come in and meet. These two are actually in parallel components. I can shrink 12 and 6 and replace it with something that I know. Already, I think we found that would be four ohm in the previous example. If I shrink this, these are the questions you have to ask yourself. What am I losing? Am I losing anything that is asked of me? No. This is here. If you manipulate this part, you aren't touching this. You aren't touching this. You are in this segment. But you can replace 12 and 6 and make it smaller. Make it one element less, fewer. Now, 20 and 80, that's a bit of a trick. People might say, okay, I don't know what they are, but they are actually in parallel. You see, these ends are the same. And these ends, although there is a kind of a rubber band, which is stretched a bit, these ends are the same, these ends are the same, these two are in parallel. I need to devise my chess game. If I replace this with one resistor, and if I replace this with one resistor, how these two resistors are going to come together? They would be in series. So I can see this and this in series. I'm going to replace that with one resistor. That resistor and this resistor, and even this resistor, they are in parallel. I shrink them and I get one resistor, one resistor, and one resistor, they are in series. I've got one more, the last R equivalent. And when I get my R equivalent, I've got my IX. Did I lose anything? No. What do I have to be? I have to be careful in terms of my analysis of the design. So let's begin. I'm going to replace 12 and 6 that they are in parallel with one resistor. 1 over 12 plus 1 over 6 is equal to 1... Uh, well, I, I need to take the common denominator. It's 1 plus 3, uh, 2, I'm sorry, 2. And then this is going to be 3 divided by 12. And then I remember to inverse this once again. So I'm going to call that 1 over R equivalent 1, perhaps. I'm going to call this 1, R equivalent 1. So if I want to find R equivalent, I remember to inverse that once again. R equivalent 1 is going to be 12 divided by 3, and that's going to be 4. This one is equal to 4. It is now easier to see that 20 and 80 are actually in parallel. I'm going to replace it with R equivalent 2. R equivalent 2. It's 1 over 20 plus 1 over 80. Where is it? It has to be the same node that they meet. So I'm going, these two are meeting in the same place, so it's going to be like this. Or even this, doesn't matter. So I'm going to actually basically put it right here. Okay. I'm replacing 20 and 80 with the red resistance. Same note, same note. That, I don't feel guilty. It's not a mistake. That, the way to do. Okay. Let's remove that. This one is R equivalent 2. R equivalent 2. Let's calculate. This is 80. That's going to be 4 plus 1. That's going to be 5 over 80. I need to invest this one more time. R equivalent 2 is equal to 80 divided by 5. And that would be um, six, um, 16. This is the long range plan. You need to say how I'm moving, how I'm coming back. What am I lost? What am I going to lose? What am I going to gain? That's what you are going to do. So, one more time, I see R equivalent 1 and R equivalent 2 to be in series. When I say they are in series, I'm going to utilize that knowledge I gain, and I'm going to replace it. 
the R equivalent tree is going to sit right here. This is R equivalent tree. R equivalent tree, because they are in series, is going to be R equivalent 1 plus R equivalent 2. This one is removed 4, this one is removed 16, 4 plus 16, that's going to be 20 ohma. This one is 20 ohma. One more time, you see all the little things we talked about so extensively about how to identify what is parallel, what is series. They all come in hand to hand to basically simplify this. You can't miss a step. You can, if you miss a step, you're lost. 15 ohm, 20 ohm, 60 ohm. One end of all these components meet here. The other end of all these components meet here. These three components are in parallel. I need to replace this, all three of these, with one resistor. I'm going to call this R equivalent 4. Since 60, 20, 15 are in parallel, I'm going to utilize the zero, 1 over 15, 1 over 20, 1 over 60. If you have 10 resistors in parallel, it's going to be 1 over every one of them summed up. That's going to be 1 over R equivalent. That's the zero. So let's do that. I'm going to have 60. This is going to be 4. This is going to be 3, this is going to be 1, it's going to be 8 over 60. Let's see if I made a mistake or not. 60 divided by 15, 4, 3, and 1, that's right. So what is R equivalent? I need to remember, it's 60 divided by 8. 7.5. 7.5. Don't be afraid if your values in the exam are fractional, it could be even uglier than this. 7.5. What did they do? I said 15, 20, and 60 are all in parallel, and I replaced it. This one is 7.5. What do I see in front of me? I see 5 ohm and 7.5 ohm in series. Therefore, R equivalent is equal to 5 plus 7.5. That's going to be 12.5 ohm. What did I mean by this R equivalent process? I said you can replace this and this with one resistor. This one. Let me show you where it is. I'm going to replace this and this that are in series with one resistor. This is what I'm finding. That's my R equivalent. That's what you asked me to find. 12.5 ohm. Unit IX, no problem. It's simple. Ohm law. The voltage of 40 volts happened to apply itself across the same resistance. This is 40 volts. Therefore, Ix is equal to 40 volts divided by 12.5. And it would be some values, such as 3 point something. You need, when you go through the process of shrinking and de-shrinking, you need to develop a game plan, a chess play. You need, to need, you need to see your moves. And you need to know what is going to be lost, what is going to be known. And you need to backtrack yourself if you have to. In this case, I don't have to. All the unknowns asked of me are actually at the 
very input of the design. So although I did shrink everything, I didn't lose anything. Everything is inside. But who knows? Who, who cares to know? Nobody wants to know. But if I need to know something, you need to go back. And each time, the voltages of the parallel components will be the same. The currents of the series component will be the same, and this should be done. Let's take a break, and hopefully we see what we can do for the next one. Thank you very much.